Hello everyone, I'm Dara Bunjan. I'm the food enthusiast here at J. Moore Living. And um, if you're turning, tuning in for the first time, I'm a food writer, food stylist, PR maven, and a frustrated baker. I recommend to people, you know, if you miss the live shows, we have an archive of all the shows that we've done in the past. Feel free to go to the web page or the Facebook page. And we always ask you to feel free if you're watching live to send in your questions. I'm going to be watching my computer screen to see if there are any inquiries for our guest or for me. Today's guest is Emmy Award winning TV host, cookbook author, who describes herself as a passionate advocate and expert on natural health and plant based food. Host of Christina Cooks. A big hello to Christina Perello. Hi, how are you, Dana? Dara, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You know, it's not thundering. There's no downpour, even though it's hot as Hades out there. Oof, and you're, you're in Philly, so I know it's probably just as hot. Um, Christina, what's on your cutting board today? Um, actually, I just finished um, pan searing rosemary scented potatoes, and uh, we did a, a like a summer vegetable, like a sukiyaki style vegetable stew with tofu for lunch. Well, I should be up there. <laughs> I think I have some leftovers. Um, let's see. In digging into your background, you are half Irish, half Italian. And the kitchen was run by the Italian side of your family. Yes, it was. You have talked about your mother being ahead of her time. What are, what did you eat growing up? Well, we had a huge garden. My, my Italian grandfather had fig trees and a garden that took up every square inch of the back part of our house uh, in New Jersey. And so we grew up with everything fresh from the garden. It's kind of a typical Italian zucchini, tomato, eggplant, garlic pasta. My mother and grandmother made pizza from scratch every Friday. We were not allowed to buy any sweets. They would make everything. They baked almost every day. My grandmother was the youngest of 17. And then not, Woo! I know. I always say they didn't have TV in Naples back then. <laughs> um, so the nine sisters were all great bakers. And my mother was a great baker. So we, if we wanted, and all we wanted as kids was Chips Ahoy. That's all we wanted. And we weren't allowed to have them because we had all this horrible, she says in air quotes, homemade baked stuff that we were allowed to eat. But we had a very, I would say a moderately healthy diet because everything was fresh. We didn't anything canned, nothing frozen. The only canned stuff we ate were the tomatoes that we jarred every August and jellies that we jarred from the fruit in the garden. But you know, and my mother at being ahead of her time, like went to farmer's markets and read everything by the Verdale brothers and Ann Wigmore. But in her, she was interesting in that she knew all this stuff and, and had us eat all this fresh food. And she basically lived on coffee, cigarettes and chocolate and died at 49 of colon cancer. It's not funny, but no, I mean... but, but it was like, so I look back now and it was so ironic and such a paradox, my life because we had to eat like the Brussels sprouts that they grew as she sat there with a brownie and a cup of coffee and a cigarette and a holder because it was healthier to smoke with a holder. I don't know. <laughs> she only stopped smoking when she was pregnant or nursing and then she'd go right back. It was such an interesting, um, she had such an interesting view, right? But she was ahead of her time in that, you know, your food was delicious if it was fresh. You could cook simply if your food was fresh. And, you know, she was ahead of her time on that um, and talking about, you know, I thought I came from a large family. My father was one of seven. My mother's one of nine. Do you have any siblings? I do. There's four of us. I have two brothers and a sister. Yeah. Great. Are they all into the natural foods? Not one. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, let me. Let me yeah. Let me come around to. A lot of times I ask about somebody's aha moment and your aha moment was not a path that you chose. And um, when you were 25, mm -hmm. you were diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. Mm -hmm. 
tell people about that and how your life changed from that. Well, growing up in the house that I did, you know, we cooked all the time, like all the time. And um, when I left home to go to college, I was so over it. I was just so over it all. I didn't want to cook anymore. I didn't want to cook another vegetable as long as I lived. So I kind of became a vegetarian junk food eater, you know, Oreos and soda and, uh, you know, whatever I could get my hands on that was processed in some way. And um, at the age of 20, almost 26, um, my mother had just passed away from colon cancer. And about four months later, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I just remember thinking, I feel like I live in a bad lifetime movie. Are you kidding me? Like, who does this happen to? And the prognosis were, was not good. They said, what, no, 30 no, days? They were not offering me much hope at all. They were saying, we'll try this, we'll try that. You lose your hair, you'll be sick. And I remember thinking, tell me again why I would do this. I mean, I watched my mother for two years, lose her hair, throw up, lose her hair, throw up. And it always came back. And in the end, it killed her after two years. And I thought, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not going to do this. I think I'm going to try another path. I had no idea what that path would be. But when I was 21, I had lived in Italy for a year. Uh, I went for two weeks and stayed for a year. And so my big idea was to just pack up my stuff and move back to Italy and, you know, die dramatically like Camille in some garret somewhere. <laughs> and a friend of mine who was actually trying to date me said he knew this guy who ate brown rice and seaweed and said it cured cancer and, and you should meet him. And I thought, oh, that sounds wonderful. Are you kidding me? But I kind of had an attitude of what ifs, you know, what ifs, I'll meet him. So I meet Robert Perello and he tells me about macrobiotics and, you know, I, the, the way I eat. And I'm like, well, listen, I'm already a vegetarian. Well, what, am, what else am I going to do? And he starts asking, do you drink soda? Do you eat sugar? And it was like, yes, yes, yes. And so he introduced me to macrobiotics, which is a style of eating that's whole on processed food, very seasonal. We use food as medicine. And, you know, it kind of harkened me back a little bit to my grandmother who used food for everything. If you had an upset stomach, she made fennel tea. If you had this, she made that. So food as medicine wasn't a foreign concept to me. Right. But now my life was on the line. Are you kidding? But so I kind of weighed the two and I'm like, well, they're not offering me much. This guy's adorable and he's offering me this idea. So, okay. So I, I decided to try it and, um, I will confess that my cooking in the beginning was awful. I, I, I didn't sort of understand what I was supposed to be doing and what the food was supposed to taste like. So it was all flat and boring. And I remember thinking death would be better on some days. <laughs> and then your wish was coming true. really. Whew, it was like, whoo. And then um, about three months in, I was in remission and I thought, oh, wait, a oh, wait, what? And the doctors all said, well, you won't stay in remission. And I was like, okay. And they were right. I kind of went in and out of remission for about 10 months. And then after 10 months, they started to call it spontaneous regression. And then after 14 months or so, they took blood and said they were unable to find leukemic cells in my blood, but that I was severely anemic. And I remember saying to them, because you're such a wise ass at 26, like, shouldn't you be happier? And they said, well, we don't think that you'll stay well. And I was like, okay. And that was like 1984. So it's so far it's worked. So far. So far yeah. So far. Um, yeah. And that's the really short version. There was a lot of ups and downs and I learned a lot and, you know, I couldn't cook at first. And then one day it occurred to me, you're a chef for God's sake, just cook the food, use the same techniques. It's just different ingredients. And that's how I learned to cook. Well, you have uh, what I call the Trinity of flavoring. There are three items. I did my research. Go ahead. Okay. So I was going to ask you to do it, but it's lemon, sea salt, and extra virgin olive oil. That's right. My mother used to say that. That's all you needed to make a great meal, lemon juice, olive oil, and salt. And I would roll my eyes. And now, you know, they're my pantry staples. That's it. There's not much else. I mean, I don't use a ton of herbs and seasonings. My food's not complicated at all. Um, I do rely a lot on it being fresh. You know, we have a CSA, we go to the farmer's market this time of year anyway. Winter's more challenging, but um, she was right at least about that. <laughs> um, I had on a fellow, Matteo Tranconi, who did a film about the pizza in Naples. He yeah. spent three years living in a van, whatever. But I came across him when he was doing these 
videos on YouTube about extra virgin olive oil mm -hmm. versus lamp oil. Mm -hmm. So can we're talking about it, maybe you can refresh people's memory what to look for in an extra virgin olive oil and what is lamp oil. So if you're buying extra virgin olive oil at a big box store in a great big container for $4, that's not extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil needs a 0.58, I think, 0.58% acidity. And, and that's achieved by picking the olives and pressing them within 24 hours because olives as a very delicate fruit bruise really easily. And once they bruise, the acidity goes up and then they have to start putting additives in the oil to bring the acidity down to call it extra virgin. So your best bet in an oil is to find what's called an estate oil, which is olives from the same farm that are picked and pressed in 24 hours. If that's not within your reach, either because of availability or because of um, uh, 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 your budget, then you move to what's called a regional oil, Tuscan, Ligurian, uh, Span you know, Spanish oil from a certain region, you know, Costa Brava versus um, Lisbon oil, like wherever you want your oil to be from. I'm an Italian oil sort of snob, although I do love Tunisian oil as well. And some of the Argentinian oils are beautiful. But you're looking for something that comes from the same region and then finally the same country. And the way you know is it's an estate oil says it right on the bottle. So does a regional oil. And it's, you know, if it says something's bottled in Italy, that's mm -hmm. not the same thing as a product of Italy or produced in Italy. That's, that's a big deal. And it's a big difference. And they play a lot around with semantics, the bigger companies. Smaller companies don't. But if you forget all of this and you're in the supermarket and you think, what do I do? There's a brand that's in supermarkets and I visited all three of their estates called Lucini, L-U-C-I-N-I. I have no invested interest in them except that I've been to their farm and it's a really good quality oil. It's a really good quality extra virgin olive oil. Everything that's not truly extra virgin in my opinion is lamp oil. Right. And somebody had just asked, are there any affordable brands in olive oil that you can recommend, which you were saying, Lucini. Lucini, and it's about $17 for about a 750 milliliter bottle, which is a good size bottle of olive oil. It, that's a really good size bottle of olive oil. And you had brought up that in cooking, I mean, we've always been told you don't want to saute with extra virgin olive oil because high heat will affect it. You, you have sort of a counter feeling about I that. I do. You can, you can heat extra virgin olive oil up to about 404 to 420 degrees. I mean, Italians don't cook with anything else. They fry in it, they cook in it, they bake with it. Um, and they're one of the healthiest cultures, all of the Mediterranean, as we know. Um, I don't know where that came from, except I think it's a misconstruence of the fact that if you heat olive oil, really good olive oil, and let's say there's no garlic or onions in it, what happens is you lose the flavor pretty quickly. So the ideal way to cook with extra virgin olive oil is to put the oil and let's say your onion and garlic in the pan and then turn on the heat. Then when you finish, you'll have that flavor of olive oil at the back of your palate because why spend the money on good olive oil? You know what I mean? It's if not going to taste it. Right. But if you right. still eat it without anything in it, like onions, garlic, carrots, whatever, you lose the flavor. That's, and I think that became misconstrued as you can't cook with olive oil. And it takes a lot to burn olive oil. If you're heating it in, in a pan on the stove and you start to see smoke rising, that's generally steam from the, from the water in the olives. Olive oil is burnt when it changes color. Like if it suddenly turns dark, that means you worked really hard and burned it. <laughs> I'm sure there's some people who have had that, oh, believe get me. that down to passion. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to tell people that not only did you have your um, Bachelor of Arts and your Master's, later on in life, you got your uh, Master's and your dietitian along with everything else that's going on here. Um, you refer to your queen cuisine as plant passionate cooking. What is the difference between vegan, whole food, and microbiotic? Are there differences? Yeah. Whole foods is anything that's whole and unprocessed. Um, and that can be anything. Macrobiotics is not necessarily plant-based or vegan. 
Macrobiotics is a, is a style of eating with its roots in Chinese medicine. And we believe, it, it believes that food is also energetic and food can be medicine. And some people, depending on their condition, may require animal food to alter their health. So very often macrobiotics is um, popular in people who need to recover their health, like I did. Um, I chose to be vegan now because I don't seem to need or want animal food ever since I was a kid. Like I was never, my father was a butcher and I was never, like I was never attracted to it. I never seemed to need it. I, I have muscles. I don't really, so it, it was never an issue for me. But a lot of people within macrobiotics don't, um, don't practice a vegan lifestyle. They, you know, it's everything about, you know, it, it's all about does the food serve the purpose of your life? at that moment and your condition. Vegan is vegan. Vegan is nothing from an animal, no food from an animal. Um, sort of hardcore vegans are also no silk, no wool, no leather, you know, no honey. It depends on how far you wanna take it in your life. Many vegans are animal activists and many vegans in this modern world are doing it for their health and wellness. So it depends on your outlook for me anything that allows us to make healthier choices, although I choose to be vegan, anything that allows people to make healthier choices and make a lighter footprint on the planet at the same time, because we're really in crisis right. now, uh, is where I'm at. And whatever step you wanna take, you wanna have vegan Mondays, uh, you know, vegan Wednesday, I don't care, I don't care. Do whatever step it will take to make yourself healthier and to make the planet suffer a little bit less. Let's talk about your new show. Mm -hmm. You've been have many shows behind you. Yeah. And it's back to the cutting board. I guess this is season three. Yeah. And 13 episodes available on public TV January 2022. How was what were the challenges during COVID to film? What can viewers expect? Um, well, we, we have uh, a new book that's coming with this series that's in production right now. And um, we decided to focus this particular 13 episodes entirely on the Mediterranean approach to eating. Because next season, which will be in 2023, we'll be shooting uh, in 22, March, April, and May in Italy. So we're kind of using this, this approach as a bridge to, to take us to the show where we shoot partly in Italy as well as partly here in the States. The challenges during COVID were, we were blessed and challenged in that I shoot at the culinary university where I teach, Walnut Hill College, and they have that beautiful sort of theatric courtyard and school was closed. So I kept my crew below 15, which was the limit in Philadelphia that could gather. We were masked up, nobody could eat. There was no communal food. Usually I feed my crew, but we all had to bring lunch. Uh, separate bottles of water, like we socially distanced. And um, the only downside, the real downside of it was usually the food that I cook on set, my crew eats like, like a plague of locusts. And we had to just, we had to get rid of everything. Like we didn't take any chances. It was a waste, which I hate, um, but that we had to do that in that series. Well, at least you were able to uh, complete it and produce yeah. it. Yeah. And I just want to say you're going to Italy. You know, I helped Stephen Racklin out in the last minute pinch to be his PA. It was like <laughs> the day before somebody got sick. My girlfriend was one of the producers. They sent me to Tupac, Arizona. Nice. So here I am. Okay. I'm, I'm game for Italy. <laughs> um, uh, March and April, not till next May, actually. We'll shoot the, the segments in the United States in March and April, and then we'll head to Italy and shoot some segments in May. I'll keep you posted. Fingers crossed. Fingers Finger, crossed. Fingers um, crossed. Supposed to yeah. leave on the thirtieth of this month for a trip to Italy. So I know. Speriamo, as we say in Italian. We hope. Well, there's a potential of me going to Turkey in September. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> yes, you know, um, we'll, we'll see. Um, yeah. uh, best or worst piece of advice, or both. The best piece of advice, worst piece of advice? Uh, the best piece of advice I ever got was in the kitchen with a chef that I was working with, and his advice was breathe. It's only dinner. 
he was the greatest guy in the world. He never yelled. He never screamed. And anytime something went wrong, he said, breathe. It's only dinner. And I think that even now under the most stressful moments, breathe. It's only breathe. dinner. The worst advice I ever got was from my mother who told me to never marry a Sicilian. And my husband is Sicilian. <laughs> <laughs> and I adore him. <laughs> well, it all, you know, the stars that. aligned that you should meet him. That's Maybe right. not in the best way, but. Yeah, and he I, and he is strictly microbiotic, or is he yeah, vegan? Well, we both eat a much more Mediterranean style diet, less Asian influence and more Italian influence. But you know, we we live kind of by those Chinese medicine principles of you know food being the serving the purpose of your life. It's funny. That's one of the questions I said. How does your studies of traditional Chinese medicine play in what you teach? It's like become it's become a marriage. It's I always say it's almost like. I have a little ancient Chinese philosopher on this shoulder and my Nana on the other shoulder. Mm -hmm. And her kitchen wisdom and his food wisdom come together to create the style that I use. Uh, let me bring up, what is the Christina Perello Health Education Initiative? That's my nonprofit that um, at the moment isn't doing a lot, but it's about to start up again between the pandemic and the problems we've had in schools with um, schools, you know, shootings and whatever, we founded the nonprofit uh, as a way to go into schools and teach kids about making healthier choices. And that's, we're going back to that mission, hopefully in 2022. Right. Okay. And I'm being corrected. I'm saying microbiotic and it macro, should be macro yeah. bio. Yeah. What do I know? Yeah. It's, it's my, I'll just say it's my Baltimore, Baltimore accent. Okay. We'll go I, with that. I thought, actually, I thought it was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, let's see. We've done that. Dup, 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 dup. Knife recommendations. I noticed in one of your books that you sort of agree with me that if you're looking, get yourself good knives, but you only need three. Chef, serrated, and a paring. That's it. You really just keep them sharp. You won't hurt yourself. And that serrated will cut through tomatoes. It's great for bread. Right. Takes. It, yeah. Yes. It, it is and I'm also very, a very. Girl. I'm a ceramic knife girl. I'm, I'm a fanatic about ceramic knives. I have at least eight of them in different, you know, iterations. I'm, I, I'm a Kyocera. They're light. They're fast. They're agile. They, you don't have to sharpen them very often. Um, they're my, they're my favorite knife. I, I would live and die by them. So how, how would you, would you sharpen them the same way with a steel and a stone? Uh, no, you actually have to send them back to the company uh, to be sharpened, but they guarantee them sharp for five years. So, you know, and I'll tell you a really quick, funny little story. I had to send my first one back to be sharpened. It was seven years. And I thought, oh, I probably should send it back. So I went to send it back and they said, it'll take 10 days. I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. I can't be without this knife for 10 days. So they actually FedExed me as a, le a loaner. So mm -hmm. I, and then my knife, they were so nice. They must have thought, who's this hysterical woman? And then, um, but they're, they're my favorite knife. Even my bread knife is uh, Kyocera. Well, I already get a note. Let's see, you see me looking off. Do you ever drop them or chip off the tip? I, do, I don't drop my knife, thank God. Um, I have chipped mine once. And the good news about the company, Kyocera, is that the first time you chip it, if it's not doing something stupid like prying a lid off a jar or, I don't know, taking a screw out of a wall. I've seen people do things with knives that make my blood run cold. Um, if you do it like, you know, chopping a squash or, or a chicken bone or whatever, they will fix it once or replace it once. But then after that, you know. And they, they said they're very amazed at how hard Americans are on their knives. Yeah. I want to remind people that to learn more about Christina, it's Christina Cooks, yep. Facebook, website, Instagram, Pinterest. Twitter. Just type in Christina <laughs> Cooks. Yeah. And all her contact information is already floated up, but you will find her at Christina Cooks. And let's see. Is there any one thing that you hoard? Espresso cups. Really? <laughs> yeah. Here, I'm going to turn the camera and show you if I can. This is just, I don't know, can you see cups? 
Yes, I can. Yes. This is a very small portion of my collection. And what I love about them is that they are, each one of them has a story. It was either a gift. There's a dear friend we travel with and we have an espresso cup contest every year. Sometimes we do it on Instagram, but usually it's just him and I. Um, each one has a story and I think they're all like little works of art. And I have at least like a hundred cups in various places in the kitchen. So that's what I hoard, espresso cups. I don't, is that hoard? No, whatever. I collect them for sure, passionately. I will keep that in mind. I, had I known, you know, I, I sold my house. In, I was in for 38 years. You take a three-bedroom house with an addition on it and go into a two-bedroom apartment, a lot of things went. A lot of things go. Right. But my, my sad thing is I have all this beautiful china. Nobody wants it, and I just can't give it away. It's too beautiful. August 15th is Julia Child's birthday. I know you met her. Can you talk about the experience? We have the new Julia movie coming out that is done by the same people who did uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's movie. What was your experience with Julia? I was at my first um, publishing event with uh, my, my friends at Penguin and um, my publisher said to me, is there anybody you want to meet while we're here? And it was a kind of a publishing public television event. And I'm like, are you kidding? I want to meet Julia Child. Are you, are you kidding? And just as I said it, she walked by with her assistant. And she said to her assistant in her brilliant Julia voice, don't forget, I need to meet that girl that doesn't cook with butter. And I was like, oh, oh, that's me, that's me. <laughs> so I meet her and her assistant said, you have 10 minutes to sit and talk. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll take 10 minutes. I literally could not speak. It's like, I was frozen in a smile and could not, I was never starstruck in my life and I could not speak. And, um, Anyway, once I could speak, she and I talked for about three hours. She was 87. And she said to me at the end of our conversation, should I give up butter? And I'm like, no, I think you're <laughs> not at 87. <laughs> I think you're okay. And then she it... it was just wonderful. And we talked about the Dan Aykroyd skit, sketch and how much she loved that on SNL. And I was astonished at how tall she was. And at this point, she was already slightly hunched over. Right, right. Up, and she was still at least a head taller than me. But it was probably my greatest culinary moment meeting her. It was like, it was like meeting a goddess. I, I just, yeah, it was amazing. And what people don't realize, I mean, she was not prudish. She, she oh, liked to have a good time. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and could match me swear word for swear word. <laughs> okay. I remember being at an event at somebody's house here in Baltimore and she was there. And she's looking at Stephanie, who was her assistant. She says, Stephanie, can we make it to the moving scene? Eyes wide shut. Good for so, her. So, you know, she, not a prude. And I think in some things that I studied on her, that when she was semi-spy-ish, yeah. she concocted a recipe for shark repellent. I actually, I heard that too. But I never, yeah. I never asked her about that. We were too focused on butter that day. <laughs> Okay. We talked um, for hours. Yeah. What was the last thing you binged watched? Uh, a show called A French Village on uh, a streaming service called MHZ Choice. And it's about um, a Nazi-occupied a Nazi French village during World War II. And there were 72 episodes. And it is, I have to say, Dara, the most haunting, um, brilliant, sad devastating, amazing, sophisticated program I've ever seen in my life, in my life. And what was that but called? It's called A French Village. Okay. It's in French with subtitles. You can start it. People can start watching it through Prime if they have Prime. And then um, you have to get this streaming service called MHZ Choice to watch it. And it goes from 1940 in the beginning all the way to 2003. And the sort of overarching theme is this was only one village. There was a lot of history to it. There were historians that would do little vignettes at the end of every season, but the overarching theme was at the end of all of it, not one life, not one wasn't completely and utterly devastated by what happened. It was, it was, um, I still, I still can't quite get over it. And I finished watching it two weeks ago. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, ultimate culinary fail. Um, 
tofu cutlets with blueberry chutney. What? Cocoa? Tofu cutlets with blueberry chutney. You don't want to know. It was <laughs> the most disgusting thing I ever made. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll take your word for it. I don't have to taste it. We're good. No, no, please. <laughs> um, what didn't I ask you that I should have? Um, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I guess if I had to leave people with one piece of advice, it would be that, you know, I, I, I'm not one to go all vegan on people, but I will say that I think it's massively, massively important that we start to eat more vegetables, you know, that we really start to eat more vegetables, regardless of what else you eat because of the impact on our wellness and how it helps the planet. And I don't know, I just want people to eat more vegetables. And enjoy their food. You know, Mother Nature made eating sexy so that we would do it. And don't let healthy cooking, like, suck the joy out of it for you. Because it's just as sexy. Just as sexy. And lemon, extra virgin olive oil, and sea salt. And you've got it made. Got it made. Christina, I thank you so much. I know you have to move on to some production meetings. But what a joy to finally meet you. And you to too. share time. And everyone, Christina Cooks. It's that simple. You can find her everywhere. Everywhere you look on the internet, recipes, videos. And be sure to tune in January 2022 for um, Back to the Cutting Board. And they can TV. those, actually, they can watch the current season right now if they have Create TV in their area. Okay. And that's online. No, that's on, on. Uh, that's on. That's the public television digital channel. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I tried getting it on my smart TV and I couldn't, but I can get it on my my uh, computer. Oh, good. Oh, good. So then they can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Right. And, and maybe the antenna. We'll see. We'll play with that. Christina, all the best. Stay thank well. You. Thank you. I don't know you that well, but moi, anyhow. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Me. My pleasure. Stay well. Next week, my guest will be Chef Allison Barshak, who is the opening chef of Striped Bass in Philadelphia. And she was nominated for Best Chef in the Mid-Atlantic. She is by James Beard. Um, her latest endeavor is Absolutely Lobster, where she's come up with a, a patented process to package lobster tails with a sauce that can be microwave that is frozen and shipping that out. And it comes out perfect. Now understand she is a chef who has worked with seafood. Keep losing the earphone here. Um, she is a chef who has worked with uh, seafood all along and in her career. And she's based down in Georgia. So tune in next week for our Chef Allison Barshak. Uh, I am Dara Bunjan, and uh, you can reach me at jmoreliving.com. Uh, uh, you can reach me at Dara Cooks is my social. My uh, email is food at jmoreliving. All these shows are archived and available, so feel free to take them for your walks, your runs, um, and your drives down the ocean horn. Uh, they're great fun. We have great guests, assorted local, national. And um, as always, we want you to stay well and safe. And if you haven't been vaccinated, you know, get your vaccination. That's my suggestion. And life will be a whole lot more open for you. As always, may your plates always, always remain full. We thank you so much for joining us. And until next week, stay well.